And I mentioned earlier that this whole scenario almost looks like the work of a very sick and twisted mind. And in order to explain that statement and to take it a little bit further, what we need to do is we need to look at the nature of the reactors, where they came from, and follow the money, essentially. It's always a good idea to follow the money in any of these situations, folks. And when we do, what we find is the names Westinghouse and General Electric. And finding those names, what we essentially find is the names of J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller. Now, there's an article that I have posted on the Crow House by a geoscientist by the name of Lorraine Murray. I was actually hoping to have her on the show this week, but she's extremely busy at the moment, so I will probably be having her on next week to discuss this whole situation. But in that article, and you can find it on the Crow House, it's an article entitled Japan's Deadly Game of Nuclear Roulette. And as I said, written in 2004 by Lorraine Murray. And she basically predicts this whole scenario. She looks at the question of what Japan would do if there was a major earthquake or a tsunami in any of these nuclear power plants. And she basically states openly that there seems to be no contingency plan in place and that what we have in Japan, by building all these nuclear reactors in such a seismically active area on the conjunction of four tectonic plates, as I mentioned, She says this is basically an accident waiting to happen and it's not a case of if there will be a nuclear accident in Japan, it's a case of when there will be an accident. And she says that of all the places in the world not to have put a large amount of nuclear reactors, Japan has to be pretty well near the top of the list. And she basically opens the article with that statement. So we have to look at who's really behind all of this. The westernization of Japan, the industrialization of Japan, the selling of these nuclear power plant designs, designed by Westinghouse and General Electric, putting them all here on a fault line, it's like, it's almost like it's been set up to happen. I was speaking to Loren about it the other day actually, and she calls it disaster capitalism, which is possibly a very apt name. And even if this quake was largely natural it would not be unreasonable to assume that they might just have to give it a little nudge with harp just to help it along because as i mentioned earlier once you actually start a quake in an area as active as japan then who knows what you may be able to create and the quake itself wasn't exactly on the fault line it was actually a little bit to the east of the fault line so that's another telling point I've actually got a friend who just got back from Japan. He left Japan four days before the quake and tsunami hit the place. And I was asking him if he noticed anything unusual, and he said there was a feeling there. There was a feeling that there was something big about to happen, and he felt that he should get out of the country. And he said he looked up in the sky at night four days before the quake, and there was a red glow in the sky. And he said to me that, well, sometimes they they burn lights on the hills in Japan and they they put this glow into the sky. But I'm looking at this red glow and I'm thinking, well, that's not where the hills are. This appears to be somewhere completely different. Why is the sky glowing red? And he thought it would be best to leave Japan. And so he flew out four days before the event and he's arrived safely home to tell the story. But as I said, folks, we can look at it. I mean, was it? caused by harp well it could have been was harp simply used to maybe give it a little nudge so that it happened anyway could have been or is it simply a natural event that's happening because of the close proximity of the moon and the elevated solar activity that we are currently seeing could be it's very difficult to tell and we can probably get into endless debates about it Or we could, on the other hand, look to see what is truly important about this, and that is the steps that we now take to address the situation we're now facing, simply because the event has happened, regardless of who's responsible. And folks, we need to do this on all levels, not just because there's a major earthquake, there's a major nuclear disaster happening. Because we're not facing only nuclear disaster, we're facing economic disaster, we're facing social disaster, we're facing disaster with wars and chaos every day, 
the situation that's been unfolding in the Middle East is, is absolutely atrocious. Things are happening all over the world because of the leadership of this planet and because of the role that society seems to have taken at the hands of this leadership. The rampant nationalism we see amongst nations, the resorting of people to violence within their nations. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see peaceful non-compliance. I've often said that. I mean, sure, folks, have a revolution, stage a revolution, but have a peaceful revolution. If the authorities or the military or anyone comes to attempt to break up the revolution, then absolutely exert enough force as you may need to repel the attack. But don't go on the offensive. Simply stand there and say, we're changing things now. We're asking you to step down. We're going to come in and we're going to install honest government. We're just going to peacefully walk in there and you can leave. We're only ever going to exercise enough force to repel whatever it is the government throws at us. I mean, sure, I can admit that this probably sounds like some sort of a pipe dream to people, but we'd be able to do it, folks. We simply need the strength of numbers in order to pull it off. And the worse they make it, then the more people wake up. And people are waking up, and eventually it will get to the point where this is simply what we do because we have no choice. So what's important to do between now and then is to build strength in your community so that as people do wake up, they've got someone to turn to, and you've got someone to turn to. I mean, sure, it's a dream that we could just stand up and do this tomorrow. I mean, we couldn't because we don't have the strength of numbers, but we have a lot more people than you might imagine. It's just that everybody's separated. They're all out there, but they're waiting for someone to stand up and start doing this. And as I said, eventually we're going to be left with no choice. So the best thing you can do between now and then is to build strength in your community and support your community when you see people within your community being prosecuted by corrupt legislation. Stand up for them. Go and get involved. Because you can make a difference just by choosing to be involved. I mean, even if you're a peaceful Christian and you're the most exceptional form of pacifist, even Christ said in the Bible that there will come a time when you must sell your robes and buy swords. And we should never forget that sometimes this is what needs to be done. But having a sword does not mean aggression. It's simply a form of deterrent, a form of self-defense, a means of exercising the force that you need to repel any attempt to dissipate the will of the people. It is truly the will of the people that needs to come to power in the world. Because, as I've very often said, all of the problems that we face are due to the leadership that we have on the planet. Well, they're due to the leadership and they're due to the system that the leadership supports and perpetuates. The instance we've seen in Japan... Whether it's a natural event that has caused this huge damage from a tsunami and this nuclear meltdown that we're seeing, it's still due to bad leadership because the nuclear power plants should never have been put there in the first place. And the only reason Japan was ever even westernized was because western forces forced their way in there and they tricked Japan into leaving nature behind and to becoming an industrialized nation. Whether global warming is a reality, which I don't believe it is. Climate change, of course, there's climate change. Climates always change, have been for four billion years, will continue to change for another four billion years at least. Man-made climate change? No, not a reality. But even if it was, why would this be occurring? It would be occurring because of bad leadership that allowed the perpetuation of corrupt corporate practices. Starvation and famine in the world. Why do we see starvation and famine in the world? It's because of bad leadership, because of their support for a corrupt monetary system, the purpose of which is to enslave the world to debt and to place people in a state of shortage. It's due to the monocropping that our leadership allows the genetic manipulation of food that our leadership allows. The wars that we see around the planet are due to our leadership supporting the stealing of resources and the bombing of foreign nations in our name. The drug problems that we see, the human trafficking that we see, 
This is because of corrupt leadership that allows these things to be perpetuated, that allows the perpetuation of a system where such things can even be perpetuated, most of which I would suggest are due to a lack of people's understanding of reality, due to the corrupt education system that our governments, again, themselves perpetuate. Every single problem that we face comes from this source. It all comes from leadership. So that is the source of the problems. But then the question becomes, why is this allowed to perpetuate? And that is because we, the people, allow this system to remain in place, thereby allowing these problems to be perpetuated and to compound into what we are now seeing. So ultimately, the issue lies with us. The issue lies with people realising who and what they are, realising that we are all wonderful, beautiful, powerful beings and that the people that live next door to you, the people that you hate down the road, these are exactly the same as you. And the only reason that you have any differences with them at all is because of the education system that you've been subject to, because of the state of shortage you've been placed in by this system and by your government that allows the perpetuation of this system. It's because of all of these compounding reasons. And most people are not even aware of these influences that they've had in their lives that have moulded their perception of reality right up to the present day. And I firmly believe that all it would take would be for humanity to simply stop and look around them and see people for what they really are. Just step outside of the matrix for a day, for an hour, even for a minute. Just step outside of the matrix. Look around you and see reality for what it truly is. It's not about stuff. It's not about the collection of trinkets. It's not about global tension. It's not about fear. It's not about the world situation. It's about people. It's about people and the planet that we live on. That's reality. It's not about living under this rigid system of rules. It's about knowing that the only allegiance that you truly owe to anything is the allegiance that you owe to the Creator. That's it. And anything that attempts to get between you and the Creator is, is invalid. You are only answerable to God and to your conscience. The governments themselves claim to get their power from God because their rules come through the monarchy, and the monarchy claims that its power is their divine right to rule, because they've simply claimed their divine right to rule themselves. No one else has claimed theirs, and so we've kind of agreed for these people to rule us. But I do claim my divine right to rule myself. I'm allowed to religious freedom within the legal system that's been put in place by this corrupt system. And my religious freedom allows me to interpret the one true God, the creator of all things, in my own way. And I interpret that God as divine, from which stems the divine law that governs all of reality, and my only allegiance is to that divine law. And that is the law of the divine trust that I have with the Creator. I will never break my divine preeminent trust to the Creator, and I will always live my life in a state of service to the creation for the Creator. That is the only law that I know, and it's the only law that I will follow. Because that is my divine trust, and that is the one true law of all creation. And living in the acknowledgement of that divine preeminent trust puts me in a position where I am simply not able to hurt another person. And even if I am ever put in a position where I need to defend myself, I will never do so as an act of aggression towards another person. I will never do anything to profit from another person. I will never do anything to do to another person that which I would not have done to me. Because to do so would be to break my divine preeminent trust with my Creator. And that is the only trust that I have and it is the only law that I acknowledge. Well, I think it's about time for a break here, folks, so I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for spending this time with me today, and I'll return to you and speak to you again in a few minutes. Thank you for listening.